Hello. Today I'd like to talk about uh, Polynesia environmental microcosms and uh, Easter Island, among other things. Easter Island is one of those places that you have undoubtedly uh, heard about in uh, TV programs and a lot of discussions about mysteries of archaeology and whatnot. Uh, it is definitely a remarkable uh, location uh, with a great deal of research uh, having been conducted and a great deal more uh, yet to be done. And it does contain some uh, fascinating uh, aspects of human history. Uh, but I'm going to uh, throw out a big spoiler here uh, and just say right up front that these statues uh, that you see here in their actual intended uh, context at uh, seaside uh, temple mounds uh, were not in fact moved by space aliens. I know that may be a disappointment uh, to some of you, but we'll talk about that here in a second. Easter Island is pretty remarkable because it is the uh, single most remote piece of land that has been permanently occupied by people. If you just go on your Google Earth uh, or Google Maps right now and type in Easter Island, uh, you will get uh, immediately an um, uh, appreciation for how remote it actually is, uh, especially when you can zoom in and out uh, on, on Google Maps. Easter is important because it represents the culmination of a process of island colonization that began thousands of years earlier. Uh, for many people uh, migrating from, uh, we've talked about the, the, the great diaspora out of Africa, we've talked about movements into uh, the Americas, and the process of island colonization that led to ultimately people first arriving in on Easter Island uh, was one that uh, had a bit of a pause. You can see here uh, the uh, on the left hand side of this map Australia and New Guinea and the uh, Islands of Melanesia uh, there uh, to the east of, of New Guinea, the, the Bismarcks, New Ireland, New Britain, and especially the Solomons. Uh, you, if you have uh, any familiarity with the history of, of World War II, you may uh, know that some uh, significant conflicts happened there, particularly on the island of Guadalcanal, uh, which is one of the Solomon Islands there. But what else is interesting about the Solomons, apart from that more recent portion of history, is that they were the furthest uh, reach of human colonization efforts in the island Pacific, uh, up to you know about around 27,000 years ago, people arrived in the Solomons. But moving eastward into these more widely dispersed and smaller island groups uh, required new technological advances uh, that did not come around until only a little bit uh, over uh, 3,000 years ago with the Lapita uh, archaeological culture, these pottery-making, agriculture-bearing, ship-building people uh, of, of more recent times. And part of the distinction between the islands of the Solomons and to the west and all of these islands of Polynesia is that moving eastward from the Solomons, you lose what's called intervisibility. You can no longer travel out from the beach of an island and gain sight of the island that you're going towards before losing sight of the island that you departed from. That intervisibility seems to have been one of the key factors influencing successful colonization of these islands in earlier time periods. Once people developed a more effective uh, navigation system, and especially the sail 
and hulls that could make large craft that could carry water and food and large numbers of people, uh, they were better able to launch these colonizing expeditions. So it's both a combination of the watercraft that they were using, the fact that they were able to bring along with them domesticated animals, domesticated plants. They had ceramics, and so they're able to produce large water jars for transporting water safely uh, over large distances and keeping it uh, safe and, and clean and uncontaminated with salt water for long periods of time. Um, all of these things come together in the Lapita period. So, so there's this rapid movement of people out of uh, East Asia into the Western Pacific Rim, uh, but there's a pause around 27,000 years ago. When that pause is, is broken, this is kind of the, the site uh, that you would have seen. You would have seen uh, these uh, double-hulled, uh, sail-bearing craft uh, moving uh, rapidly to these new islands. And in the case of this image that you see here, that's a really very new island, right? Still being formed by volcanic eruption. Here are some examples of Lapita uh, period pottery. Uh, you can see it's, it's decorated with this very fine, very intricate, what's called punctate design. And it uh, is something that we see in many of these uh, earliest layers of Polynesian uh, island archaeological sequences. You see it at the beginning, and in many instances it disappears, and people stop using uh, ceramics even on some of these islands, particularly some of the smaller uh, coral atoll islands that lack clay. If you don't have clay from which to make your ceramics, uh, you're, you're going to continue to use what you have for as long as possible, but eventually uh, it will fall out of use as being something difficult uh, to replicate and produce locally. So it's fascinating that we see that kind of sequence here. Another example of some beautiful Lapita pottery there on the top left. Top right, you see an example of one of the most important tools of ancient Polynesians, and that's an adze, a woodworking tool for carving uh, boats and tools and uh, containers. Since we're not using ceramics in some of these places, you're producing them out of wood and cloth and fiber. Uh, and so the ability to shape organic materials uh, becomes a true uh, arts, art form in, in a lot of Polynesian areas. The bottom left is an artifact of particular interest. This is fascinating. This is actually a navigational chart. What you can see here is an example of an island there in the top right, and the smaller twigs are currents and wind patterns that are shaped and changed by the presence of land masses. People were not just navigating by the stars, they were also navigating by uh, wind and ocean currents and the movements of birds and migration patterns of cetaceans and whales and whatnot. And all of these things together were included in the database uh, that these early navigators were using to find their way across the vast, empty distances of the Pacific. The closest analogy I can think of is that this is like navigating through space. Uh, when you think about the size of some of these minuscule islands amid all that vast distance of the Pacific Ocean and the ability of people to find exactly where they're going without any GPS, without any... Uh, modern uh, technical assistance uh, other than bodies of knowledge and knowing how to interpret that information through direct empirical observation. It's a miraculous example of uh, a, a scientific tradition uh, among these people uh, thousands of years ago. Uh, here's a, a replica of, of one of these uh, uh, Lapita, early Polynesian uh, sailing craft, uh, sort of one at the height of, of the technical skill of these people. And this is a, a replica uh, there in Hawaii. 
One of the things that these watercraft did, in addition to transporting people from place to place, from place to place, uh, was to transport animals. Here you can see Polynesian varieties of pig and chicken and dog, uh, all of which were domesticated uh, by these, these early navigators and, and colonists uh, and transported intentionally to uh, various islands. The Polynesian dog, there are no surviving uh, populations of those uh, because of admixture with later introduction uh, of dogs uh, varieties uh, in the historic period. But Polynesian chickens and, and pig varietals uh, can still be found in some remote areas. The one on the top left there, though, is interesting. This is the Polynesian rat. And this had a huge ecological effect in some areas, especially as you'll see when we talk about Easter Island. Uh, the impact of the rat ecologically on bird populations and plants and, and tree regrowth uh, can't really be overstated. And there's some debate, actually, as to whether it was intentionally transported uh, or not. Um, you, you can be the judge of that. Uh, I kind of lean towards unintentional uh, myself, especially given the fact that uh, they possess both uh, chickens, pig, or possess chickens, pigs, and dogs uh, alongside their other agricultural potential. But we can have that conversation at a different time. Here you can see uh, a study, interesting, of, of looking at dental plaque on the teeth of uh, archaeological examples. And their archaeologists and other researchers are actually studying the genetic code of these bacterial populations and trying to see what that tells us about the initial movements of people uh, into Polynesia. And you can see some of the source points of these different uh, genetic lineages. Uh, you can see uh, quite a bit of uh, expansion from uh, places like Taiwan and other places along the Pacific Rim uh, into uh, Polynesia, uh, as well as uh, from uh, New Guinea and other regions there. The larger pattern, though, is one that you can kind of see here. You have admixture from both uh, the uh, island groups of the South China Sea as well as uh, from the direction of Indonesia. And this is the sequence of migration. You have the Melanesian Islands and New Guinea obviously occupied first, and then from there to Fiji, thence to Samoa, then to the Marquesas, and from there out to uh, the Cook Islands and Tahiti, from Tahiti to Tonga, and then to New Zealand, but also from the Marquesas to Hawaii. So even though New Zealand is technically closer to Australia than some of these more distant areas, including Easter, um, the uh, sequence of migration we're able to track uh, by looking at both archaeological and genetic lines of evidence. Here you can see uh, Easter Island itself. Easter Island uh, is a remarkably small island that's situated 1,400 miles east of Pitcairn Island and 2,300 miles east of Chile. Uh, it's a volcanic island, but is only 64 square miles. And you can see some of these uh, major geographic features here, including uh, the... Uh, craters of Rano Raraku uh, and uh, Rano Kau, two of the largest freshwater sources on the island are these ponds inside old volcanic craters. Uh, first European contact what came in 1722 uh, and uh, remarkable in how uh, remote this place really is. But it's not entirely unique. You can see here uh, the similarities between megalithic structures on Rapa Nui and on Tonga. And it's important to remember that Easter Island is not so alien, uh, to, to not, not to put that into your head, uh, but is not so different from other Polynesian islands, is not so different in terms of its archaeological record, in terms of 
the patterns of uh, social and political and ritual activity that we see. It forms part of this larger Polynesian continuity. One of the things that does set Easter Island apart from other Polynesian situations uh, has to do with some of its geographic and ecological distinctions. Easter Island, unlike a lot of other Polynesian contexts, does not have a fringing coral reef. It's too cold. It's too far south. Uh, and the current systems that surround it do not support uh, those uh, tropical uh, kinds of settings. It also is so far away from any other body of land that it's not on a continental shelf. It doesn't have large lagoons or sand flats or kelp forests or other things. It's a mountain, a top of a mountain that just sticks straight up out of the ocean. And so the portion of the marine environment that has resources that are accessible to people is relatively small. And so even though they were agricultural people who had domesticated pigs and chickens and whatnot, um, they were unable to uh, have that backup resource of marine uh, fish and shellfish uh, that served so well in so many other Polynesian situations. They had that 64 square miles and just a little bit of addition of uh, seabirds and fish, but their ability to access that, as you can see from this slide here, would have been somewhat attenuated. And so this colonization represents the furthest uh, movement of people out of, uh, out of Polynesia. It is so far away uh, that the return, the idea of back and forth, you know, return voyages uh, is highly unlikely. And people probably uh, that went to Rapa Nui in, in all likelihood never returned to their point of origin. There are some distinctive aspects. Uh, these mata'a uh, projectile points that have the stem uh, flaked and shaped uh, in order to half them to a shaft, but then no indication of use of the, uh, uh, no indication of modification to make symmetrical or regularize the blade. A whole lot of interesting thoughts about these. One researcher suggests it's because they weren't intended to kill, but just to wound. Uh, the opponent, or that they were specifically for uh, conflict with, with people. Uh, regardless of which of those ideas you favor, they are a very uh, odd uh, artifact, uh, but are found consistently here on Easter and, and nowhere else as far as I'm aware. But you will see uh, the center of the bottom row there, you can see the stone adzes were still part of uh, the toolkit here, so woodworking manufacturing boats, carving was still key uh, to this early time period. Uh, here you can see a map showing the main concentrations of the statues and the ceremonial stone platforms, the ahus, these temples. And these ahus likely represent the seats of particular polities, of particular small chiefdoms. Remember, look at this, the, the, that scale there is three miles. Uh, the size of these, uh, of these chiefdoms uh, cannot have been very large, and yet there appears to have been a fair amount of competition and territoriality uh, surrounding uh, these, these sacred temple platforms. Really interesting uh, is the form of the houses on Easter Island. Uh, here's, here's an actual archaeological one, and here's a, a drawing a reconstructing this. Um, what's fascinating to me, uh, this referred to as a Hare Panenga, uh, Paenga, uh, is that these early houses um, on Easter Island were built to mimic the form of an upturned hull of a boat, a ship. Um, and this is the, you know, I, I, ideally in, in the, the con concept of this is that these houses are replicating the first houses that the ancestors who arrived here lived in who may have used the hulls of their boats as their first shelter uh, when they first arrived. And so generations later, their descendants are still building their houses in the form of the watercraft, the boats of the ancestors. Here you can see a map of the uh, quarry at Rana Raraku, and every single one of those uh, dots is actually showing you the location 
of a statue, either one that didn't leave the quarry or the, the hollow where one was quarried out. So you can see hundreds of these things. There's not just two of them, and they're not just uh, you know teleported by, by space aliens. These are uh, quarried with incredible skill and effort and moved from these quarries, uh, as the videos that you saw in the syllabus showed, uh, with, with great ingenuity. What's interesting is that when Europeans arrived, all of the statues had been thrown down. And so this system that likely developed uh, as, as part of a, a legacy that was brought from uh, the islands of Tonga and Tahiti uh, to Easter uh, was one that uh, did not survive till European contact. Something went wrong. Here you can see some reconstructions of uh, a couple of these Ahu, what they uh, may have looked more like uh, when they were uh, being used. And uh, one of the questions that has people have spent a lot of time on uh, looking at Easter Island is this idea of, oh, the statues and how did they move them? And those videos, I think, uh, the research by Carl Lippo and Terry Hunt from Cal State Long Beach and the University of Hawaii um, have convincingly showed that uh, it's, it's a matter of, of looking at the indigenous uh, stories about how this was done and combining that with an understanding of engineering uh, to come at a, uh, a better idea of how this, this probably occurred. Um, and it, it involves ingenuity and knowing the materials and the landscape that you're working with, uh, but it's, it's certainly something that's definitely within the realm of, of human possibility. Uh, but a, a bigger question is why, you know, were, were people doing this? Was this a way that they were trying to propitiate uh, the ancestors to help them during times of crisis? Or was it in uh, Thanksgiving for times of plenty? Uh, was it something that was competition uh, between uh, neighboring chiefs? Uh, how does this all play out? What are the motives that people have uh, for creating these kinds of structures and systems, and, and what are the ways that it then uh, falls apart. Um, one of the things that's really interesting to consider is that, as I mentioned earlier, the similarities between Easter and some of the other islands of Polynesia is, is clear. And it's entirely possible that these ideas of highly stratified societies with chiefs and highly organized religions with priesthoods and powerful supernatural forces that conditioned and constrained uh, behavior within society and a great deal of structural inequality may have actually been ideas and concepts that did not emerge here on Easter Island because they don't seem to have worked in the long run very well at all. Uh, things really, really fell apart here. Uh, but these were ideas that were in place in places like Tahiti and Tonga with much larger islands, much larger populations, much better ecological system, more uh, adapted to the kinds of crops that were brought, uh, that they were growing in Polynesia than, than Easter uh, Island, than Rapa Nui. And so this legacy adaptation, these old ideas, how is it that people persist in continuing to do things in a particular way, even when it becomes blatantly obvious that this is not working? But people in positions of power and authority are very seldom willing to surrender that power and authority, even when their exercise is, it is not in the best interest of society as a whole. And so you can look at these conflicts between What's the right idea? What's the, the best choice in this matter? And then what, how does that relate to the structures of power and wealth and status uh, that, ex that already exist within society? And those two things do not necessarily always line up uh, to the common benefit. Right here you're looking at one of the principal culprits of the ultimate ecological collapse on, on Easter Island, and that's the Polynesian rat. As people had to clear more and more land of the trees, the forests that once existed on Easter, which are attested by pollen cores taken from a number of the uh, lakes on the island, it was necessary to clear more and more of that forest to grow more and more food to support the growing population because things were working. Well, the rats ate 
all of the seeds that were left of these trees. And so the trees and the ground cover did not uh, renew itself. And because you're looking at a temperate environment that doesn't have the kinds of tropical soils that you see in other areas of Polynesia, uh, you had more erosion. As you have more erosion, you get lower agricultural productivity. So you need more land. You need to clear new land. As you do that, eventually on a small island like this, you run out of space. Uh, and then this puts people into conflict with one another, which increases warfare, which de further decreases the productivity, both in terms of the labor force as well as the freedom to conduct work without fear. Uh, just look at places around the world today where you have endemic violence and warfare. Productivity goes down. So in a combination of both social and ecological declines in productivity, uh, you ultimately end up with a major population crunch on Easter Island. And as people are less and less able to feed themselves, and as conflict becomes more and more frequent, ultimately the old systems of uh, the, chiefdom, the, the chiefs and the priests and the Ahu temples and the entire social and political structure that had sustained itself here on Easter for hundreds of years came crashing down with the Ahu statues being toppled uh, the evidence for social inequality disappearing, and even uh, a reasonable amount of evidence at this point that uh, cannibalism uh, occurred on the island. Whether this was because people had actually reached that point in terms of uh, desperation of, of nutrition, they were literally starving to death, or whether the this evidence indicates uh, a, a new... Uh, kind of chapter in, in ritual conflict between these groups uh, is, is still uh, open for, for discussion. That, that has not been adequately answered. Uh, but suffice to say, if you have even uh, a moderate amount of evidence for that kind of activity, things have, have proceeded far down uh, the, the path of collapse. Uh, a new tradition emerged, uh, the Birdman uh, cult uh, at several locations on Easter, which represented an effort by people to find a new tradition uh, following the collapse of the old one. But it only persisted for uh, a few decades before it too appears to have vanished. One of the other things that vanished somewhere along the way uh, was the ability of the people of Rapa Nui to construct large sailing craft. Uh, this probably happened when the forest cover was depleted to the point that there were no longer enough trees of adequate size to be able to construct seagoing watercraft. And once that happens, and you're on an island that's 1,400 miles away from the nearest tiny island, and you don't have the ability to construct uh, these, these seagoing watercraft, you are literally trapped on a tiny island, a tiny speck of land in the middle of the giant Pacific. And that must have been a real moment of uh, crisis, uh, both, both literal and psychological, uh, for the inhabitants. The Ahu temples are uh, thrown down. Uh, the quarrying ceases. Here you can see one statue even left in the quarry. Uh, and the largest watercraft that was observed by Europeans in the 1700s was a small two-person watercraft, not even capable of uh, departing very far from uh, the island itself, let alone uh, reaching any other point of land. And yet there's a whole bunch of mysteries still to solve uh, on Easter Island. Did they have writing? Here's an example of what's referred to as Rongo Rongo, which seems to be a repeating pattern of particular symbols, uh, but we're unable to say whether this actually represents writing or not. We're not sure. It may. If it does, and it could be deciphered, we would actually have a whole other avenue to investigate and understand these mysteries of Easter Island, these unexplained aspects of its rise and collapse and history and native traditions about this. What did the people think uh, about what was going on. This would be fascinating if we could figure out uh, how, to, how to read this, uh, if indeed it is uh, a written script, a genuine mystery. As well as that, you have examples of 
questions of transpacific contacts. Obviously, the sweet potato domesticated in South America was in fact transported from South America to Polynesia and Melanesia and further. Uh, so somebody moved, because they don't float, they don't survive in salt water, somebody moved sweet potatoes from South America to uh, Polynesia and, and points west prior to European arrival. This happened. When did it happen? How did it happen? That's a really, really interesting question. Uh, was it Polynesians that made their way to South America and then did the return trip? Was it South Americans that just did the one way? Uh, not sure, but it would be really, really interesting to figure that one out. There's also similarities in the, uh, the axes and war clubs of uh, areas like Chile and, and Polynesia. Uh, you can see there that, that image is uh, Chilean, uh, Southern Chilean war clubs and Maori war clubs. So these are clearly drawn from the same material culture archetype. Uh, now, when do we see this, and, and what is the nature of that, that contact uh, is, is unclear, but again, uh, open for investigation. There was at one point uh, a suggestion that chickens had been introduced to South America from uh, Polynesia, but that has since been shown to be in doubt, um, and the bones in question, even though they bear a superficial resemblance to chickens, actually are from a bird called a chachalaca and, and not from chickens at all. Um, so that, that's a, um, an X on the, um, the board for, for one of these ideas. Um, other ideas talk about the possibility that boats uh, were uh, exchanged. In South America, you see uh, these double-hulled watercraft, uh, sailing craft among the Inca, uh, who are actually uh, going all the way out to the Galapagos Islands. They display an incredible uh, ability to navigate, despite the fact that um, for the most part, uh, there are relatively few uh, islands in, in the, along the northern portion of, of South America for them to have developed this uh, navigational and, and uh, sea construction of seaworthy, technical ability to construct seaworthy watercraft. And so, you know, there's, there's some tentative ideas there. Uh, one that you may have run across in uh, Southern California is the suggestion uh, that the Chumash sewn plank canoe, uh, the Tomol, uh, or the Tongva Tiat, uh, depending on which uh, group's words you want to use, uh, was introduced to Southern California native peoples uh, by Polynesians uh, coming across the Pacific uh, in these large uh, sailing vessels. Uh, this suggestion is one that has some favor among some groups of people, but there's some major problems with this. First of all, the closest point of departure from any Polynesian island to California would be Hawaii. The earliest evidence that we have for anybody arriving in Hawaii was, is around 500 AD. There is clear evidence of the tools used for manufacturing uh, Chumash sewn plank canoes prior to the evidence of people being in Hawaii. So either they got to California before they got to Hawaii, um, or uh, the, the dating is off. Also, look at the slide that's right on the screen here. You see a Gilbert Islands Baurua voyaging or sailing vessel, this sewn planks of the hull being the similarity that people oftentimes like to uh, draw the, the comparisons to. The problem here is that this is a large-scale outrigger craft uh, with a complex sailing apparatus, rudders, keels, uh, freeboard, and uh, an ability to navigate across the open ocean. The Chumash and, and Tongva watercraft, as beautiful as they are, and as important as they were for the First Nations people of Southern California, have none of those capabilities. Uh, it would be uh, the, the equivalent of um, taking the design of an automobile uh, but not bothering with the whole uh, engine part um, and just pushing that around uh, with, you know, like a wheelbarrow. Um, in fact, when we do see examples of historically documented introductions of uh, watercraft into places, one of the very, very first things that people adopt um, if, they, if they didn't have it before is the sail. 
Um, for example, even the Seri uh, from the coast of Sonora live in the Sea of Cortez. Upon contact with, with Europeans, the first item of uh, nautical technology that they adopted was the sail, to the point that they would even put sails affixed to a wooden block into their Thule Reed Balsa watercraft. Uh, not the hull, not the rudder, not the oars, the sail was, was one of the first, very, very first things that they, that they adopted and used. Um, and so the likelihood that uh, people from Polynesia would have arrived all the way to Southern California and the ingenious, intelligent, creative First Nations of Southern California would have seen that watercraft there, that Gilbert Islands watercraft, and the thing that they would have picked up from that is that it was sewn together, not the part about the outrigger for stability or the sail or anything else. Uh, that, that stretches the credibility to... Uh, too much in, in my view. Um, and then you combine that with the problems with the chronology, uh, and I think uh, it's much more likely that the Chumash Tamal is an independent uh, invention of these people, solving the problem of not having uh, large trees with which to make it from, and being able to figure out how to make um, a large capacity canoe out of driftwood, um, as opposed to uh, being taught how to do this from people on the other side of the Pacific. All right, well, uh, thank you for this, uh, being with me for this sort of whirlwind tour through a little bit of Polynesia and talking about uh, Easter Island and the issues of legacy adaptations and the problems of, of unintended consequences to the environment, especially when you're constrained uh, into a tiny speck of land in a, in a vast emptiness. Uh, many people have drawn the comparisons uh, between uh, Easter and other places in Polynesia and our own situation here on planet Earth. Uh, in fact, it might interest you to know that NASA has actually funded uh, some of the research into Polynesian archaeology because it's a way to look at human colonization of new places uh, hundreds of times repeated uh, some of them failed. Mo many of them failed. Some of them failed the first time, but succeeded the second or third time. Uh, and how does that all play out uh, in real history? These are experiments that you can't do. Um, even the reality TV show Survivor um, you know, won't, let, uh, won't let the participants actually uh, starve to death. Uh, so, so NASA's interest is one that actually takes some of this, these questions about um, how do humans fare in constrained colonizing environments uh, and hopes to be able to use some of this information and data uh, to improve our uh, future efforts uh, at colonizing other places around the world. But it would be interesting uh, to think that uh, some of those ideas and concepts and lore from uh, people of, of Polynesia uh, might make its way into uh, even further voyaging of the human species. Thanks very much. Have a wonderful day.